2021 City of Tualatin regular council meeting. Uh, looks like, uh, according to my computer, we went down a walk of three degrees. We're now at 110. <laughs> we'll go in the right direction for tonight. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, call this meeting into order. And we'll lead off with the Pledge of Allegiance tonight led by Councilor Sacco. Good evening, everybody. If you please place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the moment of silence for those who have lost their lives to COVID-19 led by Councilor Brooks. Good evening, Council Well, and uh, everyone. Um, at least during um, such a hard time with the um, temperature out there, we didn't have any new deaths to report in the state of Oregon um, over the last reporting day. So the total um, cases in Oregon are 208,222. And the total deaths from COVID-19 is 2,763. And we are just over 19,000 people, 18 and over, away from reaching 70% in our state. Um, please join me in a moment of silence for people that are suffering or that we have lost from COVID-19. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So with that, uh, next up, we're going to announcements. Uh, and I believe this is Chief Steele with our 4th of July reminders. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Bill Steele, your chief of police. Uh, this announcement was was put on your agenda, you know, well before our recent weather hit us. Uh, I think at one point today, my phone showed 115 degrees. So there's probably no better time to discuss firework safety. Uh, you know, currently you can purchase local uh, Oregon safe and sane fireworks. Uh, you know, I personally would ask that our community not, you know, you know use fireworks this year. Uh, the conditions are so hazardous right now uh, that the margin for error is just so slim. So that would be my request. Uh, and every year we often have a number of people that venture out across the state into Washington and other places to buy illegal fireworks that are not permitted in Oregon and uh, set those off on a regular basis. Those, if you're caught, could result in a class B misdemeanor citation and a fine of up to $2,500. Uh, so we definitely don't want people partaking in that. Uh, generally speaking, we're always looking for voluntary compliance. And if that doesn't work, you know, we'll educate and, and use warnings. Uh, but again, in these weather conditions, if we were to find somebody uh, in possession or using illegal fireworks or our odds of getting citations are probably not gonna be very good for you this year. So uh, we want people to remember to utilize 911 in emergency situations and reporting things, um, but use non-emergency if possible. Uh, non-emergency number for everybody uh, listening in Washington County is 503-629-0111. And if you happen to be out in, in Clackamas County, you can always reach that number at 503-655-8211. Uh, again, that's kind of, you know, the 4th of July is really for the amount of calls that come in. It's our busiest time of the year. It's our busiest day of the year. Uh, our dispatch center is overwhelmed with calls reporting fireworks. So that really takes up a lot of time from our dispatchers and our first responders that are handling normal day-to-day -day things that come in every single day without fireworks. Uh, so please, 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 if you can avoid the use of fireworks this year and, uh, and definitely use an abundance of caution if possible. You know, just in the last five years in Oregon alone, uh, there's been about 1,200 uh, firework-related fires uh, resulting in about $5 million worth of damage. And that doesn't even include the 2017 Eagle Creek fire in the Columbia River Gorge uh, that, that honestly burned for eight months is what it took to, to finally put that thing completely out. So that is my message tonight. Please utilize as much safety as possible if you are going to utilize fireworks this year. So that's that's my message, Mr. Mayor. All right. 
and usually uh, PVF NAR uh, does a tag team with Chief Steel on this. So it's also a drain on TVF and R's resources to run it out, run around putting out fires, especially now with everything being so dry. So um, any questions for Chief Steele about fireworks on 4th of July? Can you say the number again, the non-emergency number for Washington County and Clackamas County? Yeah, Washington County number is 503-629-0111. And the Clackamas County number is 503-655-655. Eight two one one. Right. So, any questions for Chief Council Pratt? PVF and are going to speak too. Also, no, they're not here tonight. They okay. usually are, but she's coming. Okay. Home. Um, I, I'm I'm seriously concerned with the dry conditions and the um, expected temperature of ninety, and so. Um, I would like to add to the end of general business an item to discuss an emergency ordinance to ban the use of fireworks this year to our agenda tonight, if that's possible. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Any other questions, comments for Chief? All right. Thanks, Chief. You bet. That brings us to public comment. Public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the city council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone in the Zoom meeting or at the poll center uh, who would like to address the council, this would be the appropriate time. And I know I've got a chat that uh, Patricia Parsons is uh, wanting to speak and looks like I've got Tyler Eaton after that. So Patricia, you're first and then Tyler. Okay, thank you. It took me a minute to figure out how to unmute this. <laughs> You're gonna have to oh, it takes a while. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, I think it's the heat and this is another reason why I'm not gonna go on camera. I'm a hot mess, like I'm sure everybody else feels. But uh, thank you council mayor and the city for letting me speak. I'm gonna be very brief about this. I am encouraged to hear that a meeting was held with the gun range. Uh, thank you very much for reporting that. Um, I'd, like I'd like to know, know when the council has set up the working session, session as I'd like to attend that as well. And I'm very interested in attending a meeting with, with the range um, so that I can report back to our community the findings, uh, the status, the proposal, the progress, et cetera. All this said, I do want to just reiterate that uh, I am, uh, I have finished my letter to the press. I intend to send this out in the next couple of weeks um, and hope to uh, get this out to not only Tualatin, but the whole entire Portland metropolitan area. I also want to let the group know that I, as we work through the growth of Tualatin, I feel that it would be irresponsible for us uh, Number one, as citizens, to not call the police when we hear gunfire. This is crazy that we have become so immune to this sound that we just let it go. So uh, when, it's, when it's loud, when I hear it, I will be uh, calling the police and I'm going to encourage all of us as neighbors to do the same. I can't imagine how any of us would feel if we were wrong in our assumption that it was coming from the range and there was some mass shooting at Ibach Park or at Costco or anywhere else. Uh, I also want to let the group know that as we work through the growth of Tualatin, I feel that it would be irresponsible for us not to let developers and current landowners know of the potential problems for selling property due to this incredibly unnatural and dangerous sound. So I do have um, uh, an email out to Lennar Homes. I know that they're slated to develop over 400 homes in our area. And uh, I think that they need to know, and so do other landowners, that uh, this could be a problem. So I guess that's all I really wanted to say and report back. I thank you again for your time and your energy and uh, for you listening. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, next up is Mr. Tyler Eaton. Yes, thank you, Mayor and uh, Council members for this opportunity. Uh, uh, I do preface that the situation that I'm raising awareness to 
overall impacts a small percentage of quality residents but for those that it impacts it significantly impacts quality of life i'm a resident of twelve thirteen years and where we live on staggered street we live on one of two unpaved public streetways and over the last decade we have raised this concern multiple times to the city of street and sewer management and we are in between a rock and a hard place where the developer of these properties back in the 70s agreed to pave the street and the city agreed to maintain it and the developer failed to pave it and so the city agrees to maintain it but has failed to do so over the last decade it has been paved twice once of which has just been this last spring after several attempts of reaching out to the city for help and assistance we are unable to even get quotes for even a chip coat or a tar seal dust management is the biggest thing but since it is a public owned street no one will come out and look at it unless the street the city asks of that but the city is unwilling to do so at this time we have a lot of cars that come in especially with amazon we're across from the marquee rehab center and so traffic is pretty bad as a turnaround even though the city has put up please don't do that signs to deter that that does not work our neighbor also just started an in-home care for residents and so we have emergency vehicles coming in regularly all times throughout the day as well as cars coming in and staying overnight in our cul-de-sac because there's no light and so they hide in the darkness we had a neighbor's backyard broken into just this last weekend which then again kind of elevated this ongoing battle and so again i know this doesn't impact the city at large but for those that it does as taxpayers for the quality of life and those of us with young kids on this cul-de-sac it's it's a frustrating and helpless situation to be in and looking for wisdom help guidance and how we can move forward finding a resolution i know uh councilor hill you brought this up to our city manager and sherilyn wambos has looked into it and uh has discovered the same that you had just said that the street never got the got built out as it should have um so i know they're looking at city staff is looking at this right now and i ask you to give them a couple weeks to circle back because the biggest thing obviously is probably going to be budget and how we get this done uh so give us some time to figure out how we can do that because it's not going to be a minor thing to do i understand to bring your street up to current standards but uh we are aware of it we um and i know sherilyn and her team are working on it as this council so we will not forget about you and uh keep in touch and circle back with us or me in a couple weeks i'll let you know where we're at absolutely well in advance thank you for whatever the solution is we really appreciate it no i appreciate you or whoever reached out to council hillier to bring it to our attention you bet have a good night you too is there anyone else uh in this zoom meeting or at the cooling center which is open till nine o'clock tonight because it's so hot uh is anyone there is megan there is anybody <laughs> from staff there i'm here <laughs> all right uh, there is nobody here to provide public comment. Oh. All right, they're just chilling. All right. Uh, with that, that ends, I guess, public comment. So we'll move into the consent agenda. Uh, items of the consent agenda are considered routine. They will be adopted by one motion, unless someone in the council would like an item removed and heard separately later tonight. Tonight, the, con the consent agenda consists of 10 items, quite a bit. So item one, consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of June 14th, 2021. Item two, consideration of approval of a new liquor license application for Bottles and Press LLC, DBA straightaway. Number three, consideration of approval of a change in liquor license application for the Three Mermaids Public House. Item number four, consideration of resolution number 5552-21 authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement for a Metro Area Communications Commission grant and appropriating, and appropriating special purpose revenues in the city's general fund during a fiscal year 2020-21 budget. Item five, consideration of resolution number 5554-21, amending the city of Tualatin fee schedule and receiving resolution number 5504-20. Item six, consideration of resolution number 5555-21, Approving the authorization and well, approving and authorizing provision of workers' comp insurance to volunteers at the city of Walton. 
item seven, consideration of resolution number five 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 six dash two one authorizing personnel services updates for non-representative employees of fiscal year twenty twenty one twenty two item eight consideration of resolution number five 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 seven dash twenty one amending water sewer storm water and road utility fee rates inside the city of tualatin and rescinding resolutions five five zero five dash twenty and five five one two dash twenty item nine consideration of resolution number five 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 eight dash twenty one authorizing changes to the fiscal year twenty 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 one adopt a budget and finally item ten consideration of resolution five five six zero dash twenty awarding the contract for construction of the tualatin road sweet drive to community park phase one project which is part of the tualatin moving forward bond program is there any items on the consent agenda a council would like removed i don't see any hands up i'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as read second I have a motion a second to approve the consent agenda as read. Any discussion on the motions? All right. Uh, Council Pratt? Aye. Council Hillier? Aye. Council Sacco? Aye. Council Brooks? Aye. Council Rez? Yes. Council President Grimes? Aye. And I vote aye also. They're approved. That moves us into special reports, the annual report of the Walton Historical Society. I see Mr. Ross Baker and Ross Hoover, the two Rosses in the meeting. Welcome. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Council and Mayor. Uh, I am here to introduce the Executive Director of the Walton Historical Society. And Ross Baker is going to uh, give you a presentation and the annual report of uh, the great organization that we're partnered with. So I, uh, Ross Baker, I will share my screen and uh, uh, Ross Baker will talk about all the great things that have happened uh, in the past year. Are you there, Ross? You're muted. It's so, so embarrassing. embarrassing. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I, I do this for a living. living. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Sorry. Go past this slide. We've got to make, make up some time. time. Um, we had to learn on the fly with the pandemic. You can see on this slide, there's all kinds of things we had planned for 2020. We didn't do any of them. Uh, but when you have a time, take a look at what we didn't do. Let's move on to what we did accomplish in 2020. We had a lot of great programs. Once we got our wings underneath us and got some momentum, uh, lots of learning that we did, uh, lots of oral histories that we recorded, and uh, we're really proud of what we were able to accomplish, even though we got a couple of months uh, late start. Okay, go ahead. Um, even beyond our presentations, the things you might see on social media and stuff that we're doing in the background, we're doing all kinds of things. You know, we have the, the new rhyolite, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Glacier Rock now at the Heritage Site. The center is open Monday through Thursday, 10 to 3. We're working on getting open full five days as we used to do. We're doing our oral histories. Um, we're harvesting from our archives to continue to populate our new web page. Um, we have task forces in place to focus in certain areas that we think we're weak on. We're continued through the whole thing to do our quarterly newsletter. And um, if you're not getting that, become a member so you can because it's pretty cool. And we're gonna go back to our annual picnic this year. One more thing before we leave this one, we're working with Carlos Porcos, who did the centennial uh, watercolors for the city of Tualatin. He wants to work with us to help us raise money by doing some local paintings and stuff. So we're really proud of that too, okay? Uh, probably the most worthy thing that we did in 2020 was a, a couple of books that are gonna be coming out. One is already out, it's uh, Tualatin. It's when the river ran backwards. It's the story of um, when the big bad Lake Oswego uh, Steel Corporation went against some small onion farmers and they were redirecting the river 
and the guys blew up the dam. And the thing that's coolest about this book, well, there's two things that are cool. We had a PSU intern, Jamie Ditzel, did it for us. And the second thing that's really cool is Lois Martinazzi actually gave up the names that her father told her, the three guys that did it. And, uh, and they're in the book, so it's really a tell-all, and we love it. It's for sale at the Heritage Center. Pop in and talk to Cindy. And even perhaps more important than that, our third edition of Tualatin from the beginning, this is our Bible. This is really our important book. It's coming out probably in like August, early September timeframe. And um, it's going to be bigger and better because we're going to cover uh, where it stopped last time, 2005 until today, which means there's 30 new subjects that are added uh, to the end of the book that we determined to be history worthy. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ross. Uh, I wouldn't be an annual uh, report without talking about the Lafke Martinazzi Award, which went to Michael Antonelli with the Toilet and Life, all the great things he's done working with us. And of course, Lois Roby, the President's Award. She does a lot of work in the background. And if any of you know Lois or you see her, um, just say hello and thank you. The scholarship continued and was bigger and better than ever. The scholarship committee actually gave out two awards this year because of the pandemic. And the first is like a $3,000, the second is a 2,000. So these are pretty big scholarships. And we're really proud of what we're able to do uh, for these young people who decide that they're going to study inside the state of Oregon. Not necessarily history, but they need to study in Oregon. So the newly renamed scholarship, the Jack Broom Scholarship is alive and well, thank you. Um, our webpage, we're so proud of our new webpage. We used a lot of the grant monies that we, we, we got during the year. If you haven't been there, you need to go because it has articles, oral histories, things that you would expect us to have. But then there's some other stuff that you would be surprised that we have, like a interactive walking tour of Stualatin's historic sites. We have, of course, our online store. There's no paywall yet, but you can see what we have for sale and on and on. There's some pretty cool stuff there. And because we don't have it fully populated yet, at the end of each section, you can always click and you can go into our digital attic and you can see what's not on the web page there. It's not so fancy, uh, but it's there. And you can look at all kinds of old articles and photos and oral histories and so forth. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think the crowning achievement of the year was us getting recognized by being the outstanding volunteer group of the year. Of course, we shared this with a, another organization or two, but it's the second year in a row we've been so recognized. And Art Sazaki, our board member, probably said it best. And he said um, down at the bottom, just to get right to the heart of what he said, that we facilitate Tualatin's continuing exceptional civic awareness, pride, and depth. And I think that Art probably said it best for the whole board. Okay. Um, no, there's some additional information why, which I can't share with you tonight, but it's available if you want to do a deep dive about our membership. It's up 5% for uh, over the last five years. We've improved our membership numbers. Financially, we remain healthy. We're about where we were when we reported in 2019, but we've done okay. Uh, we did get grants. We also did get PPP, the Payroll Protection Plan. We have a complete rundown of how we spent that money or how we retained it because some of it went into our coffers and we have a report on that. Uh, we did lose our home for the, the Galbraith wagon is the old farm wagon that's 100 plus years old. It went out to the Lee's farm. The city had worked with us um, to find a place for that. And we did identify potential location and then the pandemic hit. And we even had donors matching fund, potential matching funds things, which would have paid for a lot of it. But the budget for the whole thing to build the shelter was even beyond what we were willing to do at the beginning of a pandemic. So we're thinking more about maybe a, a, a private opportunity for the near term, but we'll see. We, that's one of our challenges for next year. And our board, we have a couple of openings on our board. Uh, in case you know some history loving people that would like to apply for those, we would love to have them. Um, and I think that that's it. I'm at the end, Ross, right? Well, thank you, Ross. Uh, yeah, the uh, website is pretty phenomenal. Thank you. I, was, uh, I remember when you did the soft opening of it, I went to it, it was night and day versus the uh, old website. And it's a tremendous resource, just the pictures and the history in there is tremendous and the ability to search easily is very nice. Um, so thank you for your all your service at the historical site and the board members. Uh, it's a really good uh, group of folks that are keeping our you know history alive. Uh, I know Lois Marnazzi puts her heart and soul into that book and the updates that she published and uh, she's our 
you know, one person historian of everything uh, Tualatin. So pretty much well, appreciate her, everything she's done on behalf of the historical site and as well as other folks. Uh, any questions or comments for either of the Rosses? Council Pratt. I just want to say thank you for the um, historical society. You year after year, you guys are fiscally responsible, and um, even though you're recording history, you move forward in the way you do it, and the people you um, whose histories you record, and um, you just you do an amazing, um, unbelievable job year after year. So just thank you. Thank you. I look, I look forward to having some meetings again inside the uh, facility. It's been a long time. Last time I was in there was for the Cowboy Poet. There was only, what, about eight of us in there, Ross? So. <laughs> and this October, Mayor Bubenick is going to be our guest on our, one of our programs. So we'll be publicizing that. All right. Anything else for any of the Ross? Either of the Rosses, not any of the Rosses. All right. Thank you, Ross. Ross B., thank you for, uh, for joining tonight. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, that brings us to public hearings. Uh, item number one, consideration of resolution number 5559-21, adopting the city of Tualatin budget for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2021, making, appro uh, making appropriation, levy levying ad valorem taxes and categorizing the levies. Don, what kind of title is that? That's a tongue twister. Well, one I think I have to include on there. <laughs> so, uh, well, th thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, hopefully my connection, I, it, it keeps coming in and out a little bit, so hopefully I'll get through everything I need to get through. Uh, I am Don Hudson, I'm the Assistant City Manager and your Finance Director, and uh, the one who just loves to do this for at least six months or more out of the year. We, you, you do have in front of you Resolution number 5559-21. I won't read that whole part since the mayor did such a wonderful job with it a second ago, uh, but that is what is in front of you. Oregon statutes require the city council to adopt the budget prior to July 1st, 2021. So that's why we are here this evening. Uh, I did, so you don't have in your packet because I put together a quick uh, PowerPoint this afternoon. So let me share my screen. And that way, when I go through a bunch of numbers, uh, you'll have them in front of you to see. So what is in the 2021-2022 budget is the expenditures to continue providing the quality services that your city staff and others provide to our residents and our customers. COVID-19 pandemic impacts uh, primarily on the revenue side, but they do have some impact, of course, on the expenditures side as well. Uh, I, can uh, happy, happy to report that they are Ryan Don, gotta come back. Less of an impact than would impact to be programmed into the budget going forward here. Uh, the first one was more the uh, revenues and expenditure passed a couple months ago that is the impact to receive from the federal government. The resolution also sets our tax rates, our permanent tax rate of $2.2665 per $1,000 of assessed value. And also on our general obligation bond debt, we levy a dollar amount, $3,096,850 for our general obligation bond debt. And that averages out to be about 59 cents per thousand of assessed value. Uh, I'm happy to report that this budget also continues our fiscal prudence and it is a positive ongoing alignment going forward as well. So back in May, when we went to the budget committee, the city proposed a budget of 121, just over $121.3 million. Uh, there were some amendments that we proposed to the budget committee during that process, uh, a total of about $6.8 million. The large over 6.1 million of that is the American Rescue Plan money and that new fund uh, as well as some other carryovers that we've programmed into the budget that we've presented to the budget committee and they approved them that evening. And so on May 25th, the budget committee approved a budget of 135, just under $135.2 million, as you can see on your screen there. 
in addition to the budget that is approved by the budget committee the council has the ability to change the adopted budget by no more than ten percent of the total budget in each fund we are proposing some changes in the general fund this evening the first three are carryovers and what these are for are items that we anticipated when we put the budget together to be received by june 30th and there are some that we've realized that are not happens so we need to carry them over into fiscal year 2021 2022 are the are beginning fund balance increases to offset this uh, since you don't see the revenue side that's handled there uh, but the, the ones we have this evening are ten thousand dollars in the administration budget which is where we budget our outside legal for our labor negotiations uh, we had anticipated being a little further worse, so we're asking to carry over $10,000. On the police department budget, we're asking for an increase of $7,650, and it's actually made up of two different components. Uh, we have an ammunition order that is significantly back ordered, and we will not see that product come in until I believe it's September, and so we're asking for that. Uh, be carried over as well as an amplifier for a radio system uh, which has not been installed yet and so we're asking a carryover that as well and then the library uh, if you haven't had a chance to go in and see the makerspace classroom uh, it is nearly complete. It's not fully open yet, but it is a outstanding, uh, beautiful. Uh, some of the equipment has not been under our carry over of those funds as well. Happening in 2022, how we had some recent leaks placement up into the, the 21 20 for that replacement to be added. Now, the reason you see a negative here as well is on the expenditure side. So it's an increase in the maintenance services budget, but then on the general fund non-departmental where we have our unappropriated fund balance and our reserves, we're reducing that budget by this amount and just moving it into the uh, maintenance services budget. So there's a net uh, add to the budget completely at zero. It's just going from one budget to another. So what we're asking for this evening, <coughs> excuse me, is that excuse me, it's an adopted budget for fiscal year 2021-2022 of $135,205,650. And by adopting the attached resolution, the city will be able to operate, expend money, and incur liabilities for this upcoming fiscal year, which will begin on Wednesday or uh, Thursday, July 1st. At that, I'll be happy to answer any questions, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Questions for Bob before he freezes up again on us. <laughs> no questions for Don? Everything looks good? So I have a, no questions, so I have a motion. Excuse me, Mayor, just before the motion, I, since it's under a public hearing, I, I'm sure there's not many okay. prepared, but. Sure. Uh, so that, thank you, Sean, for reminding me of this public hearing. Uh, are there any members of the public who would like to comment uh, on this resolution, either for or against? Not see any hands going up or no one in the uh, poll center, Megan, opposed uh, with comments on the budget? Nope, nobody at the poll center and nobody let me know via the Zoom call that they'd like to speak either. All right. All right. With that, <laughs> Councilor Pratt. I would like to motion that we adopt resolution number 5559-21. Do I have to read the whole thing? <laughs> no, it's a resolution, so they're an ordinance, so we don't have to do the you know, first or okay. second. Stuff. I'll I have a motion. I'll second her motion. All right. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 5559-21. Any discussions on those motions? All right. Councilor Pratt? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. 
Council Brooks. Aye. Council President Grimes. Aye. I vote aye also. The budget is adopted. All right, for next year, for next fiscal year. Thank you, Don. All right, so moving on to general business. Item number one on the general business is considerations and recommendations from the Council Committee on Advisory Appointments. Who's gonna talk about the folks who are nominated and approved? Thank you. That was a big delay. <laughs> this is Council Reyes, Brooks, uh, and Pratt, I believe, are on the. Do you want us to just talk about it, or is there anything you want? To... Um, usually, we list the names of the folks so they get some recognition, so we know uh, who's contributing their time to the city and in what capacity. Okay. Um... I can't find the names of the folks, sorry, on, the, on my agenda. But I just, you know, I'm always proud to serve on this committee and um, welcome everyone that um, wants to join any kind of these committees to please look at the next meeting. But I can't find the names on, on my agenda, the names of the people for the architecture committee. I can read them off real quick. So we have but six reappointments for the Architectural Revo Review Board. Those being Skip Scan, oh, God, I'm getting tongue tied. Skip Stanaway, Lisa Cochocho, sorry if I murdered that, Nicole George, Carol Bellows, Patrick Gaynor, and Chris Goodell. And then on the Tualatin Arts Advisory Committee, our student is Mahadi Sridhar. And on the Tualatin Parks Advisory Committee, our student representative, is Nadia Alvarado. All the people were um, reappointments, including our students had served. And um, as usual, all of them um, were so impressed with the um, dedication they had to our city and um, their willingness to give back. So as usual, very impressive people were fortunate to have in our city. Yeah, we got great core volunteers in this city. Um, so with that, uh, we just have to approve it. So do I have a motion to approve the recommendations from the council committee on advisory appointments? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the recommendations. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, boy, people shifted around here. Councilor Hilliard, you're first now. <laughs> Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Uh, Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. And Council President Grimes. Aye. I vote. Thank you all very much for volunteering. Yes, I vote aye also. Uh, item number two, consideration of resolution number 5561-21, establishing a policy to provide workers' compensation coverage to future members of the council as volunteers of the city. So who's leading this discussion? That's a brain twister. <laughs> well, I don't, um, before we get to uh, who will cover it, um, there are, I think, some statements of um, potential conflicts that need to be um, stated. All right, so we doing that first before we get into the presentation? Okay. All right, so we've got, um, Seven members, I gotta scroll through here, just a sec. Uh, and because this deals with compensation, um, some members, we have to declare if there is a uh, conflict of interest uh, because this does affect compensation per the, a new Oregon law for city councilors. Uh, so I'll go through uh, the city council members and they can state uh, whether or not they have a conflict of interest in this item. So I'll start with Council Hillier. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am declaring an actual conflict of interest. This resolution would provide a workers' compensation coverage benefit to me during my current term of office. As a result, I am not participating in any discussion and, and am refraining from voting on this matter. All right. Uh, Councilor Pratt. 
I'm also declaring an actual conflict of interest. This resolution would provide workman's compensation coverage benefit to me during my current term in office. And as a result, I am not participating in any discussion and are refraining from voting on this matter. All right. Uh, Council Reyes. I'm actually declaring a potential conflict of interest. This resolution will provide workers' compensation coverage to council members beginning January 1st, 2023. My current term of office ends in 2022. However, I'm eligible for re-election. And if I am re-elected, I could be provided this workers' compensation benefit during a future term in office. Okay. Councilor Brooks. Uh, like Councilor Reyes, I am declaring a potential conflict of interest. This resolution would provide workers' compensation coverage to council members beginning January 1st, 2023. My current term of office ends in 2022. However, I am eligible for re-election, and if I am re-elected, I could be provided this workers' compensation benefit during a future term in office. Councilor Sacco. Um, I am declaring an actual conflict of interest. This resolution would provide a workers' compensation coverage benefit to me during my current term of office. As a result, I am not participating in any discussion and I am refraining from voting on this matter. All right, thank you. Uh, Council President Grimes. To add to this uh, fun trolley of people that are jumping out of the discussion, um, I am term limited um, as of next year, but out of an abundance of caution, there is a potential, potential future, possible potential conflict of interest. Um, and for that reason, I will um, abstain from the conversation and from voting tonight if no, I'm not. I see that I'm not. I see rather that I'm going to participate in the discussion and probably vote, <laughs> even though I might have a possible potential future conflict in 10 years, plus the end of my term. I can add that too, so thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Councilor Chris Grimes. Thank you um, for all my uh, backup singers there. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm also going to be like Council President Grimes and declare potential conflict of interest. This resolution will provide workers' compensation coverage to council members beginning January 1st, 2023. My current term of office ends in 2022, but in the future, 10 years from, from uh, you know, with term limits, I could run again in 10 years. And this uh, workers' compensation could be provided as a benefit in a future term of office. All right, so we cover it all now, Sherilyn? Yes, thank you. And I believe Sean is gonna just give you a little recap of the issue. Um, I, I, I'm looking to Sean, would you prefer if the three that have the actual conflict um, go off screen, Sean, or does it matter? No, it, it does not matter if they, uh, they just cannot participate or discuss. Okay. So yeah, right. being present is fine. So, so with that, I will uh, just uh, just briefly, as the council earlier tonight uh, passed by resolution, it established a workers' compensation benefits for all volunteers, except for the city council. Um, and because of the conflict of interest, the council could not do that tonight. However, what this resolution does is establish a policy that in the future, uh, beginning January 1, 2023, Council members who are on the council at that point in time will receive a, a worker's compensation or will be eligible for uh, being uh, covered by the city's worker's compensation insurance uh, beginning at that point in time. Now, what this does is it actually provides a benefit to the city as well um, in reducing uh, injury risk and in, in reducing uh, potential liability claims for the city. So that's why the city covers all volunteers and uh, accept the council in the earlier resolution, extending it to the council provides that same protection to the city. And with that, I don't know if Stacy has anything more to add, but that's all I have. 
Questions for Shauna Stacey? Uh, Council President Grimey. I have a question. Um, so for any additional insurance fees that would be incurred by extending the coverage to the council, is that offset then by a reduction in insurance fees because we're I'm taking down some liability for possible claims or is that not really relevant? I'm just trying to figure out like what the impact would be financially by adding the coverage for the council or if it's kind of de minimis. Stacy might be the better person to answer that. We won't know for sure until 2023, just because of the rates are set by SAFE, which is our insurance carrier. So we actually don't know what the impact will be. Um, it will be fairly small impact, but it but there will be some impact. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, my my thought on the process is, is that it will not drastically impact our workers' compensation rates. Um, but this is more of a best practices type of effort in which we would not have those that are elected actually vote for themselves to receive the workers' compensation. Um, so it's more of a coverage issue rather than a monetary issue. So for, do I have it right? So workers' comp is in place for 2021 because it was already there. 2022, city council won't be covered by workers' comp. But then 2023, it will be when a future council votes on it, correct? Our workers' compensation is on a fiscal year basis. So um, technically, you have a couple more days of being covered. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, the Don't get hurt. <laughs> correct. Um, from last year's resolution. And then this next workers' comp goes into effect July 1. All right. So there is a year gap until the next one. Correct. But then after that, and I'm looking at Sean, but I, because he will correct me if I'm wrong, but after that, you won't have to vote for council coverage ongoing. This will take care of that ongoing for the council, but you will do the annual resolution for all other volunteers, I believe. Council Brooks. Can we just go over why um, there's this change? Because I think that it's important for people to understand that um, why we have a gap in coverage for counselors this upcoming year and um, how things have changed. And um, I know that, you know, I talked about a potential conflict of interest because it's looked at as a benefit, which I understand, and it's also a liability to our city that we don't have ourselves covered this year. And I think it's a really important thing to clarify about why we have this gap. So, Sean, you want to cover what the court ruling was? So, <clears throat> so, so it was a, it, it was a, it's based on Oregon law. There's a, a conflict of interest law that essentially. As you've declared tonight, you, you cannot vote uh, to provide yourself a benefit. Um, and there was a specific opinion that was issued, a staff opinion from the Oregon Government Ethics Commission that provided that, that, ba that clear basis as to why. So because of that, um, it's been recommended uh, by staff for the council to, uh, to, to declare that conflict of interest and then um, you know, one of the options presented by the Oregon Government Ethics Commission staff opinion was to establish a policy in the future, and that uh, provides some uh, protection as far as any type of claim uh, going forward, um, and also complies with the government ethics law. Right. So essentially, that this recent rule uh, opinion said that workers' comp coverage is a benefit and form of compensation. So since you can't give yourself compensation, you have to handle it this way for into the future. Thanks for clarifying the change and thanks for helping us move through it. All right. Any other questions or comments for Sean or Sherilyn? 
So discussion from those who can comment and vote, <laughs> the four of us. Well, I'm just gonna, oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Bridget. Okay, I just wanna say that um, kind of like I alluded to, I think it's really important that um, the liability of the city and doing best practices like we would with any other volunteer carries over to council, not because of a personal benefit for myself, but because of concern for um, li liability for the city. And um, I think that um, a lot of times uh, people don't recognize that city councilors are volunteers and, um, and you know, it's been a practice of the city to cover volunteers um, to limit liability. And to me, it sounds like a good thing to continue with. And it's unfortunate that we have a gap. Right. Any other questions or comments? So do I have a uh, motion to move resolution 5561-21 to approve it? For the four of us who can vote. So I'll, make a, I'll make a motion to um, approve resolution number 5561-21. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 5561-21. Any discussions on those motions? All right, so I'll start. I remember who can vote here, Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Council President Grime? Aye. And I vote aye also. So resolution 5561-21 is passed and adopted. All right, so that moves us on to items removed for consent, which we had none. Uh, we had a request from uh, Councilor Pratt to discuss uh, fireworks in the city of Tualatin this year. Uh, so I'll hand it over to uh, Councilor Pratt. Um, hi, I just, um, I think we all have received an email or two and read things in social media very recently about people's concerns about um, the fire danger this year, um, in particular, just because of the high temperatures and how after this heat wave, especially how tinder dry everything is in our city. So um, I just have a real concern um, about people lighting fireworks off. And my, my real concern is just the fire danger. We have just, you know, we have our beautiful trees and yards and shrubbery and, um, and homes and wooden fences. And I'm, I'm just terribly concerned that um, lighting off fireworks this year is not a uh, is potential for fire danger. Um, I understand it's kind of, we're kind of late in the process. So we'd have to have an emergency ordinance to ban them. Um, one thing that could be considered would be, um, I don't know, I don't think there's right now, they're adding a, a fine to um, setting off fireworks. Um, the discussion I think to be had is whether this will help reduce this. Um, I know, um, Chief Steele's here, but I'm sure they're pretty um, spread thin that evening already. But I still think that if this can in any way reduce um, setting off fireworks and potential fire hazards, that we should consider it right now. So I'd like to hear what others have to say about it. Others? Other comments? Councilor Brooks. Uh, thank you, Councilor Pratt. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I too have been concerned. It feels a little, I've been looking around um, and know that we're in the middle of a historic drought, that we had concerned about water shortages. Um, and we still are looking at, um, we have mitigation in place around from the chlorine shortage, but we have water shortages. There's fires being fought in surrounding areas. Um, and we have a record break in heat wave and we have this um, holiday coming up 
And as much as I want to return to normal like everybody else, um, I also feel that we've had um, ice storm. We've had a lot of catastrophe after catastrophe and the horrible, horrible smoke issues that we had last year. And I'm very concerned as well about um, unintentioned fire starting in our community. Um, I feel like I'm living in a tinderbox and a uh, furnace and a uh, health ward all at the same time. And um, I just don't wanna see things get worse from not doing something. So I appreciate you bringing it up. I would be supportive of just banning, like lighting off fireworks. Um, yeah. Mr. Sacco. Um, I have, I share the same concerns um, and I hate to put anybody on the spot, but exactly what would that look like if we did um, impose an emergency ordinance to ban fireworks? How would that play out? And um, do we see people following that if we do move forward? Um, I would just love some additional information and feedback on how on how, like what the next steps would be like and what the broader scope would look like. So what would happen is we could direct uh, Sean Brady to uh, draft a emergency resolution that would prohibit the use of fireworks uh, this year in the city of Tualatin. Uh, it wouldn't prohibit the sale because the tents are already up and we don't want to um, impinge on people's ability to raise funds for their organization, but it would basically just ban the use of fireworks in the city of Tualatin uh, for this year. Um, Sean could present us some draft language tonight. And uh, because of our council rules, if the vote is unanimous to pass a resolution, we could pass it as an emergency resolution tonight. So it would take effect for July 4th or whatever period that's in this resolution. Um, City of Ben just did this. The city of Eugene is doing it. City of Camas is doing it. Washougal is doing it. Uh, people are super worried about fires. Um, you know, most of the time the fires are caused not by the legal fireworks, but more likely in Oregon, the illegal fireworks. But uh, as someone just mentioned, one little spark is all that's needed right now, be it a legal or illegal firework. So most, a lot of cities in the area are asking folks to pass on lighting fireworks this year because we don't want to see fires like we saw you know just recently and as chief Steele mentioned before uh the ones for a couple of years ago that that big fire started from a firework uh, that was jokingly thrown in the woods next thing you know we had a massive fire for months um so that would be the thing we could do tonight is uh i think sean could share a document uh we could review it tweak it, and then if it's unanimous, we can approve it, and it would be going to effect uh, with, you know, by tomorrow. And, and then I know um, in discussion, you know, we heard from Chief Steele earlier about um, the, the police efforts on this, and, you know, we have limited resources, so I'd like to ask Chief what he thinks of the idea. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. So, yeah, I mean, I can't disagree with anything that's being said here tonight. Uh, obviously, a, a change like this would require us to, you know, immediately kick off an educational campaign to educate our community as best we can. Uh, and there's still going to be members of the community that might not be watching this tonight or following us on social media. So we'll do our best to get that message out there and then make sure our staff are aware of the direction we're going. And Again, you know, we're always looking for that voluntary compliance. We got to educate people. We utilize a lot of warnings when possible. Uh, so that's probably not going to change in a, a, you know, a change like this that happens fairly quickly. Uh, you know, our officers make great decisions every day and uh, they have a lot of discretion that comes along with their positions. And we're going to rely on them to make good, good decisions as, as we move forward with a potential enforcement of, of something like this. Does that answer your uh, question, Councilor Sacco? Other are we comments? banning it? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, are we banning this just for this year or is it forever? Just this year. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to be clear that what we're saying here. Yeah. Council President Grimes. Thank you. Um, and I do, I understand everybody's concerns and 
I know, I'm, I'm watching the wind outside right now and it just makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. You know, my concern though is when we're looking at less than a week in time, which makes an educational campaign, I mean, that really, you know, makes it kind of tough. And then, you know, we're addressing, I mean, obviously the illegal fireworks that come in from outside of the state or just north of Washington, they're always a problem. And they, you know, airborne, they're very bad. But I, I just, I'm a little worried about people that have perhaps, you know, they're buying in the city from a legal vendor, legal Oregon fireworks and you know, potentially they may not hear the message, they may not find out about the fact that, you know, a ban, potential ban goes into effect. And I just, you know, I worry about a, the penalty phase of something like that on people that in good faith made a legal purchase from a legal vendor and, and you know, them incurring a fine or some sort of a, you know, something that was done completely and totally with the best of intentions and you know they get the back side of that so i mean i worry about that because it's just such an incredible short window you mentioned some of the other municipalities are thinking about doing this are they kind of on the same time frame as we are or did they act earlier there everyone's, everyone's reacting because of the draft the extreme temperatures, everything happened in the last two or three days. Okay, all right, that was, I was concerned about their window also, thanks. And at the, the point you're making about uh, financial implications of being caught doing it and not knowing, I think that Chief mentioned, I think his, his officer would lean towards warning versus writing tickets or citing people, that's what they've done for years. Uh, unless, you know, obviously, if the police come, give you a warning, and then they have to come back, then they might have a different message the second time or something like that. But uh, I think our police officers do a pretty good job of, you know, warning folks versus writing tickets right away. Uh, Councilor Pratt, you had your hand up. I just wanted to address what Councilor Grimes and um, was saying. Like I, I looked up the band, and they're actually charging seven hundred and fifty dollars for lighting off legal fireworks. And I think that's a little out of bounds, but um, I, I wouldn't want some awful fine on people. I, I just I just want a message out there to reduce this as much as possible. And I, saw, I think I saw Council President Grimes, then Brooks, and Council Hilliard. Yeah, I just have a question, and I don't know, maybe this is a strong question, but for the vendors who are selling legal Oregon fireworks and are either doing it as an actual business to make money or they're doing it as kind of a fundraiser. Us banning the use of fireworks in the city, does it make us, I mean, because we're kind of crushing their business. It feels like a little bit. I mean, are we putting ourselves in any kind of jeopardy by potentially sort of pulling the rug out from under them after we gave them the business license or they're making a, a legal sale that's legal in the state. And I don't know, I might be borrowing trouble, but it kind of seems a little dicey. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. You can have Sean weigh in, but that's, you know, that's what other cities have done. They specifically don't prohibit the sales for that reason, that people can still buy them. They just can't use them this year, but um, you know, John can always weigh in on this. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I, as I understand it, you're not considering banning the sale, just just the use uh, for that reason. Uh, and you'd be doing it under emergency, essentially an emergency declaration. So because of the heat, because of the dangers that fireworks present related to that heat, um, this is a reasonable um, emergency action for the for the council to take, um, and and then. Uh, even even if that hurts sales, it's not it's not something that is uh, uh, that I would argue it, it, that a vendor could come after the city uh, against us because that is done under legal authority by declaration of emergency and by um, the extreme circumstances that the that the city is in at the moment. 
think it was Councillor Sacco, Brooks, and then Hilliard, right? Or I got the wrong wrong order. <laughs> so is it Councillor Hilliard first and then Brooks? I think it was me. All right, I saw hand, all these hands up. Now I see Councillor uh, Reyes. So Councillor Brooks, go ahead. I just I just want to say um, to Councillor Pratt's point as well, as far as the um, fines and bend, I when I was on vacation um, the last month or whatever it was, I had the opportunity to drive through miles and miles and miles of fire damage and um, understand why communities that see the damage and all the homes that were burnt day after day after day, um, including fire trucks that are on the side of the road that are burned out completely, how many people's lives were lost. And then I got a chance to hang out in the desert and it was actually cooler than it is here right now. And then I got to drive back through a fire in the gorge and divert traffic through that fire. So it sometimes feels like these fires are far away, but I've watched all of the, and, and we've used water on like the hydrangea, everything's just shriveled into uh, dry um, tinder in my yard. I know I'm sure I'm not the only yard and we have a sprinkler system, not everyone uses those and I appreciate that. Um, so I think that the intention for me, anyway, of looking at this is not to be about the business of um, doing harm, but to be of the business of being leaders as far as saying this is a dangerous time to be lighting off fireworks. And um, a ban is a way of saying refraining from that it's not about trying to penalize people or businesses, but trying to be smart and look at my surroundings and know this seems to be a dangerous time to be in the business of even lighting a match outside, much less of fireworks. So I, um, I would hate to not take leadership and then have some horrible accident or incident and have any loss of property or life to anyone. Yeah, I think the, uh, I've been listening to all the points and they're all valid. I think that I, um, we have to be, you know, wise in a sense. I mean, um, there, it is hot outside. Uh, it is, it's dangerous and, um, it will cool off a little bit, but I feel like I'm with the rest of, um, with the, other counselors that um, for this year, uh, we should be careful about it because of the, just the heat and, and the situation and, and what it can cause, potentially can cause if anything goes wrong. Um, but I also feel that um, if we are gonna go out there and, you know, we have to also, we can't, we can't just uh, find everybody at one time. I'm, I'm with that as well. That because it's such a short notice and people have bought already our work and who was expecting 115 degree weather three, two weeks ago. I mean, no one, no one was. And so, um, so I feel like, yeah, there's gotta be also some kind of warning um, on some people that might have already purchased our work. And, and if they do it, then, you know, kind of let them know, hey, you can't do this, not this year. Um, so I'm in, in favor of that, um, but we, you know, yeah, lean on the side of cautious. I mean, it is scary out there. So that's my Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sacco. Um, so what, what, what time frame are we looking at? So are we saying no fireworks until the fourth? Are we saying, and I don't know exactly what um, the verbiage is of letting fireworks off in general uh, on days that aren't the fourth. Um, are we saying through the fifth, through the sixth? Um, I guess my fear is that people are just going to then wait until the ban's lifted or whatever the case may be that we have all these fireworks. Um, so it's how we frame the time, the timing um, and what are people's thoughts around that? Ben did, or what are the other cities doing, um, if you've heard? July 9th. Ben went to July 9th. And 
Councilor Hillier, you're up. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I guess I would love to see us in tandem uh, work with the parks department around messaging because I think all of us have probably cleaned up parks and you see cigarette butts that we continue to clean up though our parks are smoke tobacco and vape free. And as we've stated here, you know, a match could light, you know, just even throwing a cigarette out the car window, as we saw on the freeway with Enchanted Parkway with good citizen, good Samaritans stopping and putting that fire out. I'd like to see us um, expand the messaging um, to ensure that that all folks are, in our community are pulling together to keep us all safe through this season. So, uh, Sean, can you? Um... You have a sample resolution that you can share? I do. Um, Based on just research of what's happening in Bend and other cities in the area. Can you see that okay? Yep. So I, I don't know if you want me to read this or just want to uh, want, want me to scroll through it. Uh, I think you should read it for those individuals who are just listening and not looking right. at a screen like we are. I'm Good sorry. Point. Okay. Um, so the title of this resolution, uh, at, this is as proposed, and again, the council can change this in any way. Uh, it's a resolution declaring a state of emergency related to extreme heat and the dangers of fireworks and prohibiting the use of fireworks within the city of Tualatin. It has several whereas clauses, whereas the city has been experiencing extreme heat for several days, including multiple days with temperatures above 105 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the National Weather Service issued a excessive heat warning for the region, including Tualatin, whereas the current National Weather Service forecast for Tualatin shows daily high temperatures exceeding 90 degrees Fahrenheit through at least July 4th, 2021, whereas the extreme heat is contributing to all Two, there should be an an, an already high fire danger. Whereas according to the National Fire Protection Association, fireworks cause over 19,000 fires and require emergency room treatment for over 9,000 people in the United States each year. Whereas under ORS 401.309, the governing body of a city may declare by resolution that a state of emergency exists within the city which resolution may establish procedures to prepare for and carry out activities to prevent, minimize, respond to, or recover from an emergency. Whereas under Tualatin Municipal Code, Chapter 1-7, the city has established an emergency operations plan. And whereas under ORS 401.309 and TMC 1-07, a declaration of state of emergency is necessary to protect life and property to minimize damage to life and property and to ensure the city of Tualatin has the appropriate resources to respond to the emergency. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the city council of the city of Tualatin, Oregon, that in the first section, section one, declaration of emergency, a state of emergency for the entire city of Tualatin is immediately in effect and will remain in effect until some date, uh, 2021 or other date, unless sooner terminated or extended by the Tualatin City Council. Section two, emergency conditions. The following emergency conditions have resulted in the need for a state of emergency. A, extreme heat and dry conditions. B, dangerous conditions for the use of fireworks. And C, significant likelihood of fire damage from the use of fireworks. Section three, use of fireworks prohibited. The use of any and all fireworks as defined by ORS 480.111 within the city of Tualatin during this emergency is strictly prohibited. For purposes of this section, use includes lighting, exploding, or igniting in any way. Fireworks displays approved by the Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue or the Oregon State Fire Marshal are exempt from this restriction. Use of fire fireworks that are illegal under state law continues to be prohibited at all times. Violations, and this is a section just so that everyone is aware, TMC 1-7 provides for violations of any emergency order. So that's what this section is referencing. Pursuant to TMC 1-7-070, any person who violates the measures set forth in this resolution commits a civil infraction and shall be subject to a fine of $500 for each violation and may be prosecuted in municipal court. Section five, city manager authority. The city manager or designee is authorized to take all necessary actions 
authorized by law to enforce this resolution. City manager or designee is author authorized to coordinate response and recovery efforts related to this emergency, including but not limited to requesting assistance from the state of Oregon and Washington and Clackamas counties. And then the effective date, this resolution is effective upon adoption. Thanks, Sean. So it sounds like um, where people would have the questions are is when it's in effect to, and then questions around the fine uh, is that, you know, do you have to do the fine or it could be, you know, up to and including or something like that get, that gives the officer discretion. So what do folks think? First, uh, first thing I'm going to do, if you can, uh, so I can see everybody again, Sean, then we can probably go back to this. The first thing I got to do is find out, make sure that all uh, seven of us are supportive of this type of resolution because it has to be unanimous. So if all seven of us are not in support of some sort of resolution, then we'll just stop talking at this point. And, so and just, 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 just to clarify, Mayor, so because it's an emergency declaration, it actually only re require, it would require a majority of the council. Okay. If it, if it was an emergency ordinance, then the council rules would require it to be a unanimous ordinance. All right. The fine details of this stuff. <laughs> All right. So I, I, based on our discussion, I know there's, there's a, a majority, so we'll keep on talking here. So uh, I guess let's do the easy one first. The date, uh, as I mentioned before, that what I've been seeing is anyone's going to July 9th. Um, and uh, I think as, as Councillor Sacco asked, I remember seeing an Oregon state law, there's only in, uh, I think, uh, in Oregon state law and 12th in law uh, ordinances, there's only certain days and times you can explode fireworks. Um, and it usually ends like, it's only on the 4th, you can't do it on the 5th. Um, so those people who, like uh, Councilor Sasko said, hold on to them and try to wait us out. We could just say to July 9th. So everybody okay with July 9th? All right. So on the second item, Sean, how could you word it that, um, you know, the officer has discretion that would be up to and including a $500 fine? Is that how you would say it? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so, I mean, currently, uh, you know, under, so you can set the fine at whatever amount the council wants to set it at. Uh, the officers normally don't have the discretion to establish the amount of the fine. It, it's whether or not to fine or not. Okay. And then the, the judge has the discretion to reduce that fine, eliminate that fine, or, or settle that. All right. So, uh, okay, Council Brooks. I just think if we put May in front of it, maybe subjected to the $500 fine, but I do like where um, Sean was going. If it's a standard with um, breaking emergency um, resolution, you know, like having something that protects life. And because if something terrible were to happen, I would want us to be um, going along with what our standard protocols are for emergencies and it is just a um, unfortunate set of circumstances all tied together around this particular day. Okay. Other comments? President Gray. Yeah, um, I just have a real problem with the fine part. Um, I mean, we already have a fine um, protocol for people that are using illegal fireworks like non-Oregon fireworks and I do think that's appropriate because that's been well publicized it's been well established I think everybody knows that and agrees in principle or in fact that that is very important I just have a real problem with um the lack of time we have to get the message out and you know penalizing people that just through no fault of their own, just might not have quite gotten the message and think that they're being compliant. So, you know, I would really prefer to see something that does not have a fine if it was purchased as an Oregon legal firework. But, 
No, I, no, I was just to say, but for the others, I, I wouldn't want to make a single change in that because that, that's just horrible. I understand, I understand what Councilor Grimes is saying about the fines, but um, if the police warn somebody, if, say in this situation, we're really relying on the police, if they're, um, they give somebody a warning and these people totally ignore them, if there's not a fine, what is there to stop them? That would be my concern on the other end of that. Good point. That they get their, <laughs> they get their warning and then blow it off and the officers come back and they're, you know, you're going to give another warning again? Well, how did, unfortunately, we, my cul-de-sac in years past, we've been on the receiving end of attention from the police. And believe me, the first time they come around, you don't even want to have a discussion a second time. But, you know, they also are very nice, um, nice about confiscating things also. And so if there's an emergency order in place and they go and, I mean, if they sensed that people weren't, you know, gonna wanna be very compliant, I mean, they could all, always confiscate the fireworks and that would kind of solve that problem. I don't wanna put the police in a, in a pinch and I don't wanna make them be like an on the spot enforcer of having to do things. I just have, I just feel badly about- That's what they do every day. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I don't want to have like the sliding yeah. scale of justice yeah. and the police having to like make this decision right then and there about, you know, putting you know, stress on them. Can I weigh in, Mr. Mayor? Oh, sure, please. You know, again, you know, that is unfortunately the role of a police officer and they get to face those dilemmas every single day. And, you know, we're not going to be perfect, but again, you know, I rely on our staff to make those decisions every day and they do a pretty darn good job of it. And, and so we, we do need kind of that, that teeth component to it to have some type of action to fall back on. Uh, but I don't honestly think this is going to be something we're going to be utilizing a significant amount of. This is, I don't want to say symbolic in some ways, but we need the community to understand how severe the hazards are this year. And, and we need some help, but we need to kind of have that, this, this is an option to fall back on if need be. Uh, and again, you know, even years up to now, I mean, you all live in this community. We have firework issues, just like every community around us, but we're not uh, taking a firm enforcement stance on every person we contact with fireworks in years past. Our officers are exercising that discretion. They do have that tool available to them to seize it. Uh, and then we kind of move on to the next issue. Uh, but this does give us one more option if we run out of, you know, plan A, plan B and plan C don't work. This gives us an option to issue a citation if need be. That's Reyes. Yeah, I think that we're, we're all seem to be on and like thinking the same way. Um, I do uh, want to let you know that if this is an emergency, it is going to be, I'm thinking of the people that are, um, don't speak the language and this really has to move forward quickly. I mean, because uh, a lot of them, what if they, if they don't speak English or anything, they have not read this, they don't know anything, there goes a cop, and then all of a sudden there's this big issue that may happen from this situation as well, since it's, what, four days, five days prior to the weekend. And so I feel like we have to be also, uh, if we're going to communicate, we're going to move forward, we got to do it quickly, because it, it, a lot of these individuals may have already purchased fireworks and they're getting ready to do something and you know have fun with their families and all of a sudden they're not understanding there's a cop coming they have not read the emergency uh here's this big issue that may this little thing that may become a big issue so let's just kind of just want to let you know that whatever we do we gotta uh, make it clear and make sure that everybody uh, knows it in Spanish or any other languages that we're using out there because it will, it can potentially become a little bit of a, if no one has read that uh, specific emergency. I mean, I'll try my best, but to, to spread the word, but still, you know, I'm just want to make sure that we're careful with all this. Okay. Councilor Hillier. Um, I think that is also um, 
a concern I have, and I think that's an opportunity. We have such great partners, um, the police department, but the school district. And so, I mean, we could put it out even potentially flyers at the um, lunch buses and, and a variety of different things to different parts of our community that, that I'm not gonna tr even try to dictate, but we have tons of um, community partners. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to consider um, talking with them about this communication plan. I mean, I know the city has the ability to text this out too. So, you know, they can send out an emergency text to those folks. Uh, I've gotten texts in the past when we've announced stuff to the city, so we can use that. We've got the fa Facebook, Instagram, Megan's a master of this. So I think we can get the message out fairly quickly. And again, if someone doesn't realize it, officer shows up, they explain the situation, officer warns them, and, you know, it's, it's over. They, you know, the officer moves on. So. Council Brooks. I'm just gonna say one last thing, even with a fine, um, if someone's roof catches on fire, that's gonna cost a lot more than $500. Um, it's a lot more distressing to go to a site where someone's been a burn victim um, for police officers. And I think that safety, I think the nature, I just wanna commend, um, Sean on the nature of the resolution because it really is about protecting people and property from a situation that we're in right now that's hazardous. And I really appreciate the work. Thanks. That's a wrap. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little concerned because I, I just tell you, um, our job is to protect also our, um, the city and our resources and the people that are out there for us um, protecting the city. But you get a, a lot of times we get on the fine thing, and I'm gonna go back on that a little bit. I just think of people, okay, they might get a fine and then all of a sudden they have to go to court to pay it or they might not have the money to pay it. And then, you know, nothing happened. And, you know, we didn't get any fire or that. And then all of a sudden they're afraid to go to court. They're afraid to pay the fine. They're, it's just, I just, there's a lot of things that can spark out of this besides fire. So I wanna also make sure that our officers are not in a situation where they're gonna be um, on the news or anything for something that could, could I don't know, easily be, uh, I don't know, the fine is a little bit on the, we should have a fine, but also, I don't know how much that would, that would be of a, you know what I mean? That we're not leaving someone without, bread and milk and food, you know, on the table. I don't know. So, or a roof over their head. I don't know. I just, you just, just be very careful on how we're, we're going to put a fine and how much that's going to look like. Because for in my experience, the people that get, what I've seen in the past is the people that get uh, affected by a lot of this stuff are people that are not, um, don't have the means because they didn't, somehow the communication and not get to that, so. I've seen some, some, I've seen some cities that have done, the lowest I've seen is 250 as far as the fine. So, you know, 500, 250. Um, so like Chief is saying, you gotta have the carrot and the stick. And the carrot is the warning, the stick is, you know, the fine. Chief. Yeah, just one other quick thing, you know, so the, the last week we've been suffering through this heat. Uh, there's a lot of people in our community that don't have air conditioning. So they got their windows open and we've been responding to a lot of noise complaints, uh, a lot of noise complaints. And we have a, a, an ordinance in the city very much like what we're looking at doing that has a fine that goes along with it for violating the noise ordinance. We have not issued any citations for the violation of the noise ordinance, even though there's technically a lot of violations going on. Again, our officers are using that discretion, but they have that tool there if they were to need it, but we're not using that at all. We're, we're educating people on what's going on. We're working with people to solve those issues. And that solves about 99.9% .9 of our issues. So uh, where are we at with this? So looking at Sean's thing, we, we agreed on July 9th. Uh, sounds like uh, most of us are happy with the fine knowing that the police will probably more than likely use uh, warnings rather than fines and fine would be the extreme if they ever had to use that. 
uh, where other people think. Because as Councilor Reyes says, we want to get this done tonight because we also have a development commission meeting after this. So what's the what's the pleasure here? I I like how it's written with the date of July 9th, and I don't know if I make a motion to pass emergency resolution banning fireworks in uh, Twelton. With and the I also want to say that I appreciate Chief Steele's um, uh, leadership and understanding of how our police force is planning on utilizing this. It sounds like just would be people that would be really adamantly um, uh, break, you know, just just being very um, oppositional is how we would say it in uh, therapy world. Thanks. So Sean, on Council Brooks's motion, where you know that you needed an and, we don't have to be that nitpicky, do we? Well, I, I, I changed it uh, as, right. as we were speaking <laughs> when I noticed. Um, and, and just so you know, thank you to Nicole. She gave me a resolution number. Uh, if you are so interested, it's 5562-21. So Council Brooks, you wanna restate your motion? Yes, I think I got it right. Um, I move to adopt um, resolution 55622-1. 5562-21. Okay. And it has everything the same except the July, the insertion of the July 9th date. Okay. Um, Amending to 5562-21. Second. A motion a second to adopt resolution number 5562-21, the emergency resolution uh, banning the use of fireworks in the city of Tualatin just for this year. Any discussions on the motion? Uh, Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Well, it's fine. I'm sorry. I, when, it, when you said this question, we, we left it at five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. Can we reconsider the fine amount? Uh, we'd have to amend the motion in a second. Uh, sure. Yes. All right, Council Brooks. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Council President Grimes. With great input from Chief Steele, aye. Thank you. Right. And the chair votes aye also. It's unanimous. Uh, the emergency resolution takes effect for July 4th uh, for fireworks in the city of Walton. Thank you all. Uh, with that, uh, any council communications? Councilor Pratt. Really quick, I just want to thank um, Sean and city staff for helping move this forward and make sure it's, you know, it's communicated to the, everybody affected as much as possible. Councilor Hillier. And I'd like to say if there's anything that we can do as counselors to help get the word out, please let us know. We're, we're here to serve. Yep. Any other council communications? All right, so we'll go ahead and adjourn the city council meeting. Uh, we close this PDF and then we have to switch our hats and become development commissioners now. So we'll go ahead, I'll call into, to call to order the June 28th, 2021 City of Tualatin Development Commission meeting. Um, first item on our agenda is public comment. Uh, public comment is an opportunity to, for anyone to address the commission regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone here who would like to, to address the commission, this will be the appropriate time. Hearing none, we'll move on to the next item, which is our consent agenda. The consent agenda tonight is our items that are considered routine. They will be adopted by one motion. Um, by the commission. Uh, if anybody in the commission would like this item, we only have one removed from consent. Please let me know now. All right, the consent agenda tonight consists of one item, consideration of approval, the Walton Development Commission meeting minutes 
of April 26, 2021. I have a motion to adopt. I'm, I'm moved that we adopt the consent agenda, approve the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion second to approve the consent agenda as read. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Sorry, Commissioner Sacco? <laughs> Aye. Commissioner Pratt? Aye. Uh, all right, Commissioner Grimes? Aye. And I vote aye also. All right, moving into public hearings. Uh, item number one, consideration of resolution number five, uh, 629, I'm so used to all the fives before, resolution number 629-21, adopting the Tualatin Development Commission budget and making appropriation, appropriations for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2021. That's, well, at least there's not that ad valorem in this one. I was going to say, Mr. Mayor, I tried to make this one easier for you. I quickly made that change after the last uh, resolution you had to read, just for you. Uh, anyway, I am Don Hudson. I'm still your assistant city manager and finance director. What you have in front of you is resolution 629-21, 21, 2022 uh, fiscal year. Uh, we suggest or we uh, recommend you adopt the attached resolution, which is the, the budget, the City of Tualatin Budget Committee's approved budget from uh, March or May 25th, 2021. There, we have no changes that we are recommending this evening. So, a total budget for the Tualatin Development Commission of four million eighty-two thousand eight hundred twenty dollars, divided up by the Tualatin Development Commission Administration Fund of six hundred ninety-one thousand ten dollars. And the twelve or the uh, Leviton Tax Increment District Projects Fund of three million three hundred ninety-one thousand eight hundred and ten dollars. Uh, this will allow the commission to operate starting on Thursday, July first. At that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Questions for Don. All right. Do I have a motion to adopt the resolution? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 629-21, adopting the TDC budget, making appropriations for fiscal year commencing Thursday. Can I interrupt? I apologize. I think- yeah, no, I did it again, didn't I, Sean? Jeez. It is a public hearing, thank you. So for those folks who are still with us on the Zoom call or Zoom meeting, do I have any uh, public testimony either in favor or against this resolution adopting the TDC's budget for fiscal year 21-22. All right, seeing none, I'll move on now to asking uh, for a motion. I'll try again. Um, I'll make a motion. To, to approve resolution 629-21, adopting the TDC budget and making appropriations for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2021. I second. second. Okay. I don't know if it was first into the shoot there. Uh, I have a second to uh, adopt resolution 629-21. Any discussion on the motions? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hillier? Aye. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Sato? Aye. Commissioner Pratt? Aye. Commissioner Grimes? Aye. Commissioner Brooks? Aye. And I vote aye also. The resolution is adopted and the budget approved. That moves us on to general, thank you, Don. Uh, moves us on to general business, item number one, consideration of resolution number 627-21. The Tualatin Development Commission commencing the formal public review process for the Herman Road substantial amendment. And see Jonathan, and now we disappeared. So I guess Jonathan's leading, I assume. Actually, uh, or is it Elaine? Elaine will be leading this one. All right. But uh, on behalf of staff and our consultant, Elaine Howard. We are pleased to present the Leventon Substantial Amendment, which has been a multi-year process, but I'm gonna give it over to Elaine. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Um, this presentation, I think, is tied to the district, uh, the, the next item. Oh no, Leviton, okay. Um, the role of the Urban Renewal Agency in the Leviton Amendment is uh, what we will talk about first. Um, I, we will also go through the preparation update of boundary projects finances, a briefing to Washington County, impact on taxing districts, and the next steps. This shows the existing Leviton tax increment district with the expansion. The expansion is simply adding the right of way to be able to do the Herman Road project. However, because you have already added 1% of acreage, it becomes a substantial amendment by statute and both that and the fact that your project cost exceeds certain thresholds in the plan require that you pursue this under the substantial amendment provisions. So you can see on the far right that the added section is 7.88 acres and is the proposed right of way for the Herman Road Extension Project. Jonathan. So the proposed project, um, which obviously better, more qualified people can explain that at a later date, <laughs> this is the Herman Road design conceptual plan. So as, as you see here, this is just the actual proposed concept plan that has been provided by the Community Development Part Department and Mike McCarthy. Um, there are currently in your staff report, and I'm gonna pull that up, and you can still see that, but in the staff report, they wanted me to include that currently the project update is that the design team has surveyed existing topographic conditions and surveyed residents and businesses as well as forming a citywide project charter team. Uh, the conceptual design options were developed based on a community and charter team input, transportation needs and the available space for the roadway and sidewalk, uh, as well as the design team held a virtual open house to listen to the community perspective on these designs and they identified a recommended design and it confirmed with the charter team. According to the community development department, the next step is to advance the recommended conceptual design to engineering preliminary plans, including coordinating that design with environmental agencies and the railroad, working towards final design and the eventual construction, as well as the integral part between the Tualatin Development Commission and the City of Tualatin, an intergovernmental agreement between the Tualatin Development Commission and the City will be provided at a later date for consideration in fall 2021 for uh, the staffing services as well as the financial models through the financing department. Next slide. So we, before we talk about next steps, uh, this district is no longer taking division of tax revenues. That was ceased a number of years ago. Um, even though we aren't, you aren't taking division of tax revenues, you have to follow the requirements in the statute that says you have to brief and consult and confer with the different taxing districts. That would be the next step if this amendment passes tonight, which would be a mailing a letter to them tomorrow that tells them you are hoping to undertake this project and this is the remaining project within this area. Um, and it is specifically for the Herman Road extension. You are also required to brief Washington County. They are not uh, required to take any action on this, but a briefing is required by statute that's scheduled for August 3rd. There will be a public online open house, some information put um, online in July, so coming up soon. The Planning Commission will review the project for its conformance to the comprehensive plan on July 15th. The City Council will hold a hearing that is advertised citywide on August 9th, and they'll vote on the ordinance August 23rd. It has to be a non-emergency ordinance, so it does not go into effect until 30 days afterwards. We do not expect any um, opposition from any of the taxing jurisdictions because it is simply using up funds that are already existing and has uh, absolutely no impact on them. So 
What you are reviewing tonight is the approval of that project and the approval of putting that uh, Herman Road right of way into that urban renewal area. And this would be a time for questions or discussion. Thanks, Elaine. Questions for Elaine or Jonathan? Commissioner Pratt. I don't have any um, questions. I just wanna, um, I'm just really excited about this project and having, um, giving safer access to our businesses, both you know vehicles, pedestrians and bikes. This is something a long time needed. And I know somebody was pretty creative in getting this added, probably Jonathan, and I really appreciate it. Other comments or questions? All right, I, I echo count, uh, Commissioner Pratt's comments that I wonder why it took us so long to figure this out, <laughs> to use this and you know make those improvements to Herman Road that's been sitting there forever since I've lived in Swalton uh, and now get those things fixed. Uh, so this is a terrific use of urban renewal money to make that a safer road, especially for bikes and peds, because I've heard stories from Jeff Fox of when he was biking down that road, sometimes almost getting clipped <laughs> on that little stretch of Herman Road. So thank you, Jonathan, for, you know, uh, thinking outside the box and making that happen. I'm not going to take all the credit. I mean, this, <laughs> this, was, this was a collaborative effort. So uh, it... And it, if it wasn't for Kim trying to help me understand the project design and convey that, it, yeah. And then obviously Sherilyn and Don helping me out with the legalese of it. So, thank you all, all for you. Thank you very much because it's like we all know it's very much needed and is uh, going to make uh, Herman Road a much better uh, through fair for folks who use it. Any other questions or comments for Jonathan or Elaine on this subject? So I have a motion on this resolution. We have to have public comment first. No, this is general business. I'm not messing this one up. All right. I motion that we adopt Resolution number 627-21 of the 12th Development Commission commencing the formal public review process for the Herman Road Substantial Amendment. I will second that. Right. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 627-21. Any discussions on those motions? Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. Commissioner Brooks. Aye. I vote aye. It's a, uh, it's unanimous for resolution number 62721. All right, moving on to the second item of business. Consideration of resolution number 628-21 of the 12th and Development Commission commencing the formal review process of the Southwest and Basalt Creek Development Area Plan. I assume this is it's the same two folks, <laughs> Elaine and Jonathan. So, Jonathan, is this mine too? This one, yeah. And this was a, <laughs> this one's a more detailed power. It is. Um, so, uh, this one is more detailed than the process, uh, although the same does have impacts on taxing districts. So, it it, it um, will have different. Um, different consequences, maybe different, different sequences will happen from it. So the role of the agency tonight is to send, consider sending the draft Southwest and Basalt Creek area plan and report out for formal public review, including sending it to your plan commission, um, doing your consult and confer time period with the taxing districts. That's a required 45 day time period. Washington County will need to take action on this particular uh, plan adoption because there are unincorporated properties within the area boundary. Um, there is required public input um, 
and a citywide notice that will notice for the hearing, which the city council is projected to do on August 3rd, and then consideration of adoption of the ordinance. So we will go through some of this in more detail. Jonathan, thank you. We did have an advisory committee review and give input um, on this. We had three separate meetings of the advisory committee. We reviewed the boundary. Um, on the boundary review, we did change the boundary as the, at the request of one of the advisory committee members to add the parcel that uh, will provide affordable housing within the area. Um, we reviewed projects. We did have input from one of the committee members to add additional projects. Um, I, I think we might go over that um, later as we talk about the project section. Um, we reviewed those projects and uh, the committee decided to stick with the projects as recommended by staff. And we went over the financial components of the proposed urban renewal plan, including the inputs to the taxing districts. That advisory committee was comprised of uh, 12th and Valley Fire and Rescue. So one of our key taxing um, district partners. Um, it also had um, one of your city councilors uh, on the committee, uh, one of your planning commission members, um, a resident uh, representative of Portland General Electric, um, Jonathan, who, who have I missed? Yeah. On, the sure. on the committee. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we had, had Portland General Electric. We had CEPA, which is the affordable housing. We had a property owner. We had a representative from the planning commission and Councillor Saka from the wall. Yeah. Okay. So the public review process does include the agency meeting. So this is a televised um, meeting and Recorded, um, if anybody wants to review it, I'm sure they can. There is the planning commission meeting, the city council meeting, and then there will be general public information posted to the website. Next slide, please. This is the proposed boundary of the area. It includes both the Southwest industrial area and the Basalt Creek concept plan area. It is a total of approximately 717 acres it is connected uh, the connection is a, a cherry stem to the far left of or west of the uh, map that you see here that connects the two areas that allows this to um, be a, an urban renewal area considered as one uh, we have had legal counsel review in the past that says all urban renewal areas must be physically connected in some way. And so we um, made that physical connection and cherry stems are a perfectly um, acceptable way to do that. They have never been challenged as a way to connect to separate areas. Next slide. These are the proposed projects for the urban renewal area. They are, uh, the majority of them are utility projects. Um, so the Tonkin Loop sewer project, they are shown both in constant dollars. So what uh, the projection for their cost is today and then year of expenditure dollars. So as this is a 30 year urban renewal area, the cost of these projects go up annually due to inflation. We've included a 3% inflation factor in the plan. So that year of expenditure project cost is the estimated cost at the time that this will actually occur in the future. Um, so we have the Tonkin Loop sewer, we have the Basalt Creek gravity sewer, the Southwest Tualatin gravity sewer, the 124th uh, future Lake Street signal, uh, Tonkin trail, property mitigation, the Blake Street extension, some small business grants uh, for existing businesses within the area, the, the highest cost project is a water system upsizing for the area and then financing fees for 
undertaking debt in the future, placing those bonds to be able to finance your urban renewal area and then administrative costs over the time frame of the area. Um, next slide. There are limitations for acreage and assessed value within uh, cities and for a city your size, you may have up to 25% of your total acreage and up to 25% of your total assessed value within an urban renewal area. The acreage here proposed is 13.68% and the assessed value is um, very small at just 1.9%. So that leaves you a lot of capacity for the other urban renewal potential area that you discussed earlier this evening. Next slide, thank you. The maximum indebtedness was calculated. There shouldn't be a re on that, but it was calculated using a 6% growth scenario. We reviewed that growth scenario with um, your finance director for the city, um, understanding that there is a lot of property within the area that is undeveloped. So there is huge upside potential within the area. The proposed maximum indebtedness is $53,200,000. Maximum indebtedness is the total amount of money that you will have to be able to spend on projects and programs over that 30 year life of the area. Next slide. This just shows the anticipated funding over the lifespan of the area. As we know, and um, as we briefed you in the last couple of years, urban renewal areas start out slowly. So the initial years one through five, there is an estimated $600,000 of funds from this area. And then those funds increased um, in year six through 10 um, and as you go forward. So the maximum indebtedness, although it is 53,200,000, the total amount of proceeds that are anticipated to be taken through division of taxes is around 60,700,000. The reason that is higher is because that includes potential interest on debt. And that is not calculated in the maximum indebtedness figure. The capacity in projects in today's dollars is approximately 29 million. And that is what that project list that we reviewed earlier adds up to is uh, approximately $29 million. Next slide. Again, we have to have county approval of the plan due to unincorporated properties. And um, Jonathan, you can probably help me point out or describe where those properties are. And it is anticipated before any development actually occurs that those properties um, would be annexed, um, but they, they aren't being annexed now um, at, at, as you are doing the urban renewal plan. Go ahead, Jonathan. Right. Back to this, yeah. And showing us, Jonathan, where uh, un and, yeah, unincorporated properties are. Do you see my mouse? Yes. yes. Yep. So these are the unincorporated properties. They're very far. Okay. Next slide. So in this urban renewal area, as proposed, there would be impacts on taxing, taxing districts. Urban renewal areas are not providing impacts on property tax payers. So your citizens who own property do not see an increase in their property taxes due to urban renewal. Those impacts are on the impacted taxing districts. Next slide, Jonathan. Those are over a 30 year time frame, and we have prepared this information for both the general government taxing jurisdictions, which are on the slide here um, for each year for the total of 30 years. Um, next slide. These show the impacts to both Tualatin, Tiger, Tiger Tualatin School District and the Sherwood School District. Both of those school districts have impacts 
the Education Service District and Portland Community College also have impacts. As we remember for the school districts and the education service districts, that impact is indirect. They, their budget does not directly decrease due to urban renewal. The impact is on the state school fund and the state school fund is made up of other sources, including property tax revenues. The state legislature establish, establishes a per pupil funding ratio modified by individual district characteristics. That per pupil funding ratio does not go down directly as a result of urban renewal, either in your city or any other city within the state. Next slide. The next steps in this process is uh, mailing taxing district letters again tomorrow, briefing Washington County on August 3rd. Um, they like a briefing before they take their action. Public input will be a July um, online open house. The Tualatin Planning Commission, July 15th, the Washington County will consider their vote on the plan due to unincorporated properties by resolution on August 17th. There is a Tualatin City Council hearing August 9th. I said the wrong date earlier. Um, and the vote on the ordinance on August 23rd. Uh, again, you have uh, prepared a, a resolution on this one, Jonathan, not just a motion. Yeah, we, oh, yeah, we have a prepared resolution with okay. the appropriate attachments. Okay. So uh, that is my input. And if you have any questions, let me know. And Jonathan, um, I don't know if you want to add anything about other input you've received. Um, so in your staff report, in addition to the staff proposed projects, we have highlighted two citizen proposed projects that have come across from citizen involvement or citizen, excuse me, the urban renewal task force. Um, one of the projects was the stormwater management plan and the other one was the goal five inventory. In your staff report, you will see the reasonings behind why staff did not include the proposed projects, one, the stormwater management plan has been allocated funding from the city council, not the Tualatin Development Commission to commence in 2021 uh, under the purview of the community development department. As for the goal five inventory, we, uh, Elaine and I related to uh, the task force member that this is an appropriate use of TIF dollars, however, the direction must be given by the city council and cannot be assumed by the Tualatin Development Commission because this is a land use action and the Tualatin Development Commission cannot supersede the city council. But if the city council wishes to direct that kind of funding to the Tualatin Development Commission, they may do so. We just felt it was important to include it in the staff. <clears throat> Jonathan, because I'm really tired, could you uh, give us a quick overview of Goal 5? <laughs> is, oh, Steve's not on here, but Goal 5 is a natural. Oh, he is. Steve, oh, Steve great. is on. Yes. Steve is on. <laughs> I'm here. Thank you, Councillor Pratt. Um, I do have a quick kind of PowerPoint that gives an overview. Of, you know, it's getting kind of late, but if it pleases the council, I'll um, introduce that. You got it, Steve, or do you want me to pull it up? Yeah, if you can pull it up, sorry, I'm on, I'm on my other computer. <laughs> and as Sherilyn pulls that up, we'll just uh, keep saying that the projects that we've presented to you tonight have been directly sourced from prior work that the city has done over the last uh, 10 years from the salt, uh, Southwest Industrial Concept Plan to the most recent of the Basalt Creek Area Concept Plan. So these are projects that have been previously identified through vast public input. Um, but 
While we're waiting, Jonathan, on that, um, um, the one proposed project on the, um, I think it was the stormwater that you said was allocated to 2021. Does that mean that um, it's in the budget for the upcoming fiscal year? For the city, for the city of Walton, yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Sherilyn. So just in, in talking about goal five specifically, I thought it might be helpful just to provide a little refresher or recap of what the statewide planning goals are and do. Um, it's It gets a little bit detailed and so I'm gonna try to keep it hopefully high level and then um, answer any questions after I go through a couple of these slides. Um, the long and the short of it is, is that there's currently 19 statewide planning goals um, they came out of the Oregon statewide planning land use program that kicked off in 1973 and then was further solidified with the adoption of the goals in 1974. Um, the goals are policy statements on land use, citizen involvement, housing, natural resources, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, and so what the statewide planning goals do is they provide policy direction and so they're implemented through a variety of other regulatory frameworks. And so there are specifically Oregon administrative rules that detail how cities and counties in Oregon are intended to comply with the goals. And then for cities like Tualatin who are in the Metro urban growth boundary, the Metro functional plan adds a layer of additional um, rules or in some place supersedes some of the Oregon administrative rules in how cities comply. And so a couple examples of where the Metro rules supersede are in goal 10 for housing and then goal five, which pertains to natural and other um, significant resources. And so then the last pieces of the puzzle are that those first three ingredients go into the city's locally adopted comprehensive plan, um, which needs to comply with all three of those for its wall and because we're in the Metro. And then our development code has to be consistent with the policies and goals that we adopt locally in our comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. And so specifically getting to the heart of the matter, what is goal five? Um, this summary on the screen is just a short blurb from the actual goal itself, protect natural resources and conserve scenic and historic areas and open spaces. And I think you'll probably agree that this is really one of the central components of Oregon statewide land use planning program um, and is in general made Oregon a great place to live. There's some other um, additional comments there just about basically policy guidance um, on how this is supposed to happen. Again, at a fairly high level, um, but just gives a flavor of kind of what um, a little bit more about what goal five is about. Um, next slide, please. And so the big question is, how, do, how is goal five met? How do cities meet goal five? And so under those administrative rules, which are the second layer under the goals, there are kind of two processes. There's actually a couple more, but there's the default process, which cities um, and counties, particularly those outside of the metro area still follow, um, is to inventory goal five resources and then adopt <clears throat> a list of significant natural resource sites. And so that would be either in your comprehensive plan or development code. And then there's also a process which is known as the Metro process. And so basically at the end, at the last time goal five and the administrative rules around it were adopted in 1996, on the horizon was a plan by Metro to adopt its own local set of um, Metro rules of applicable to cities and counties in the Metro UGB that were essentially different than this kind of older way of going through a goal five inventory and doing significant natural resources sites. Some kind of background reasons for why this was so is primarily because of the fact that, um, you know, cities are, are much more complex, parcelized, urbanized, and, and it's very hard to do, a, a hard and expensive to do a significant natural resources inventory. You need to get property owner consent, um, there's a whole bunch of other kind of factors that make natural resource inventories um, hard. And so uh, essentially another mouse, another better mousetrap was invented. Um, next slide, please. And so what happened following that, that Metro process kind of rule in the 
Oregon administrative rules is that Metro adopted a title to its functional plan called Title III, also um, just right around the same time that the Oregon administrative rules last updated in 1996. And it, it, it gets pretty detailed, but just kind of the high level long and short of it is, is that um, this terminology called water quality resource areas came out of it. And so basically what they are is they're um, creeks and streams in the metro region, um, rivers too, um, although some of the rivers have their own rules, so we'll, we'll just limit it to creeks and streams for the most part. And then there's a vegetated corridor, which is um, a buffer next to the actual body of water itself um, that is protected from development. And so there's there's kind of in Metro has their own model code, which they encourage cities and counties to follow um, that provides a formula for how the uh, extent of the vegetative corridor is calculated. But suffice it to say, it generally varies between 25 and 100 feet for small streams, 25, and then for larger streams up to 100 feet. Um, and then later on, um, there was kind of a sense that um, that Metro wanted to wanted to do more um, to address natural resource protection and pre preservation. And so um, there was, it was a multi-year effort, but it ultimately culminated in 2005 with the adoption of Title 13. It was called Nature and Neighborhood. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may have, may have not. Um, and what it did was it created um, what are known as habitat conservation areas. And so in many cases, they were simply concurrent with the vegetative corridor. Sometimes they were slightly more expansive and it varied. Um, in kind of both of these areas, development is generally pro prohibited. There's obviously exceptions for certain water dependent uses, things like roads and utilities and other things. And then there's also, of course, um, schemes under which development is allowed. Um, in exchange for mitigation. And so mitigation generally means um, if you kind of impact an area of these protected areas, then what you would have to do is you have to do enhancements to the riparian area. And so this is something that Clean Water Services does a great deal in our community and the other communities um, that are within Clean Water Services District is basically plantings that enhance, and you, you've seen this all with your, with the stormwater presentation, it's plantings that stabilize stream banks um, you know, mi mitigate for erosion and all of those other kind of good things. And so there's, there's a lot of great things going on with that. Um, next slide, please. And so then the last piece of the puzzle is how does Tualatin comply with um, goal five and then the administrative rule and then Metro titles. And so prior to Metro title three and 13, and you see this in um, our development code, we have uh, a significant natural resources chapter and there was in 1995, so just prior to um, the change in kind of philosophical approach to natural resource preservation, there was actually a, um, an inventory done um, in Tualatin. And so you can find a list of sites that are included in that inventory and resources that are protected. And so then post um, Title 13, 96, 1996 and on, Clean Water Services um, as design and construction standards. And so chapter three of those design and construction standards, which apply to Tualatin. Um, so because we're a, we're a member of the CWS jurisdiction, we essentially, we have to, um, we have to let them use these regulations in development that we see. And so they provide standards that apply to sensitive areas and vegetative corridors um, that protect them with, protect them from development and comply with title three. And so, like I mentioned, it's that it's it's a very similar. If you go into their construction standards, it's a very similar regime to the Metro's uh, model code, which has uh, a set of a set of calculations based on the slope of the adjacent bank um, that determine how large the vegetative corridor. And so, specifically here in Tualatin, um, and I think all for all jurisdictions as well, um, development activity, and that's really anything big or small. You know, building permit. Um, whatever other kind of land use action that there is um, must submit a pre-screen as clean order services to determine just even are there, is there the potential of sensitive areas before anything even kicks off. And then on our behalf, we um, include that as a requirement for all of our land use applications that the applicants submit 
um, verification from Clean Water Services that 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 this um, process has been completed. And then lastly, um, post Title 13, um, what happened instead of city instead of Tualatin and some of the other cities in Clean Water Services jurisdiction, instead of adopting Title 13 regulations directly, um, they all joined together. Um, it's about eight jurisdictions, Washington County, Clean Water Services, joined together to form what's known as the Tualatin Basin Plan. And so what that plan did was it used Clean Water Services existing Title 13 protection standards because they were thought to be um, so comprehensive that they effectively were similar to the combination of Metro's Title 3 and 13 standards. And then additionally, um, Clean Water Services committed to expansion of a capital program to su support restoration and volunteer activities. And so you've probably seen or heard of that um, going on here in Tualatin and like I said, in some of the other communities for Clean Water Services. And so it's, it's a very com complex topic and I've hopefully kept it at a high enough level and broken it down into the component pieces um, with that said, I'm happy to answer any questions from the commissioners or the chair. Questions for Steve? I feel like five, we keep- Goal five and six slides. <laughs> yeah, well, we keep getting questions about compliance with goal five and so for me, it was um, important to, I guess, have Steve kind of give us something of a rundown and hopefully that that addresses and answers some questions that we keep getting. Appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Brooks. Um, thanks for the presentation. I think, it, you know, it's um, really important to understand because it, it is complicated. And I will say that I understand community concerns um, because uh, at my last water consortium meeting, we, we talked about five local um, rivers that are in distress right now at the lowest, two at the lowest levels historically they've ever been. So understanding, are we doing a good job protecting? And especially when we're making decisions during a time of this kind of heat and global warming, um, where we're doing things that are not carbon sequestration by doing all this development, how are we mitigating? Um, at the same time, we have this, you know, uh, terrible situation with homeless people and with need for the community. So how do we balance these things? And um, so the community concerns, especially with water out there, with sloping and with, um, and with the wide open spaces that so many Oregonians have wanted to preserve. And um, it's good to understand how it, it goes. I guess my question too with the, you know, like clean water services for doing the planting and, and, um, and sort of repairing areas, um, are we doing things proactively so that we don't have to repair so that we do things in a way that is proactive and, um, you know, and are we thinking along those lines when we look at what we're doing out here in this in this new area of development? Um, maybe Kim, did you wanna chime in there? Well, just the trying to do it proactively. I'm not sure, um, Councillor Brooks, what you're, you're meaning by that, but we have to work with them and we are working with them before they come in with our application. So that's where we can be proactive and encourage like the preservation of trees along Norwood and the larger water quality facilities that will do a much, much better job than a bunch of small facilities within that big 400 lot subdivision. So in that instance, we're being proactive and helping them steer them towards design like we did on the PGE site where it doesn't have the you know uh, fences and things and the plantings are, are good good quality plantings that still meet the requirements of clean water services. I think also just... Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. And, you know, we go in and replant because things have, you know, they're not. So I think that, um, thank you very much. Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're fine. I, I just wanted to attack on that clean water services does work with landowners in um, proactively in vegetative 
invasive vegeta vegetation clearing and planting. And so obviously, I mean, I think one of the big factors is that, you know, private property owners control a lot of these areas. And so there's certainly limited opportunities in some cases. But I mean, my experience has been that they're really good about um, about being proactive and working with those landowners. Thank you. Well, thanks um, for the goal five review. So uh, I'll switch back to Jonathan and Elaine. So Jonathan uh, showed us the two things that were suggested by the public or not included in the report. Uh, what else do you have as part of your presentation, Jonathan and Elaine? Go ahead, Elaine. Hi. Um, when we were on the project page, I meant to say that the projects in an urban renewal plan when adopted are those projects that you can undertake. However, urban renewal plans go for 30 years. So there will be changes over the life of the urban renewal area where you may want to change projects or a project may get funding from a different source so it's not needed to be funded through urban renewal anymore. Or you may have additional money uh, left over from one project that you can do to another project. So it's just to understand that these are the projects that have been proposed at this point in time. But if new projects come up or projects need to change, you may do that through a minor amendment to your plan, which is just a resolution by the Tualatin Development Commission. So it's easy to do. So I wanted to make sure people understood that. And then there's also a financing plan and the report that accompanies the plan. That financing plan can also be changed annually as you do your budgeting process. So if a grant opportunity comes up for a specific project and you need to leverage um, your grant application with suggesting funding that you might have, you're able to change the timing on when those projects might occur. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're, is that, it for your presentation, Elaine and Jonathan. All right. So questions for Elaine or Jonathan on this resolution? Council Pratt. I just wanted to mention that we're down to 82 degrees, by the way. <laughs> but, um, um, my question is on the, um, there was $19.9 million in there for parks funding. And um, I just, kind of want an explanation of that. And um, besides really liking to have a beautiful ballpark park there, big area, my real concern is that um, when the non-residential SDCs were passed, there was a lot of discussion about making sure there were areas available for businesses, for their employees to go, you know, um, like a picnic areas, small parks, I guess, areas for them to go or walk. And I want to make sure that those SDC funds are going there. But before that can happen, there has to be some mechanism to buy land. So um, I, I kind of guess I'm asking a couple of questions combined there. So I hope you can answer them. So I think Elaine and I will tag team this particular question. So I think the project that you're referencing was the Basalt Creek Park that we originally identified from the Parks and Rec Master Plan for $19.9 million. So that project was included uh, with the Urban Renewal Task Force. And there was a good discussion had about one, why was that included from staff to begin with? And it was an identified need based on council's priorities of expanded natural, natural recreation resources. Through the conversation and really what is appropriate of urban renewal financing and also input from those affected taxing districts. Uh, the project was removed at this time. And Elaine, if you would explain to our commissioners why parks and public facilities aren't really um, supported by other entities. Okay. Um, so, so a couple, I, I want to hit that too, but a couple of other things to consider is the original list that Jonathan brought to the task force was a list of all deficiencies uh, that was provided by your city staff. So that parks was part of that. We didn't have enough money to fund all of those. We, we only had enough money, uh, you know, the $29 million or so in present value. So given the input of the committee, um, 
we we cut down that list to equal that twenty nine million, knowing that there were other resources available for some of those recreation needs for so for the park. Um, the fire districts and other special districts have been very active uh, in Oregon over the last maybe even 20 years. But in, uh, in 2019, they were very active in trying to change the types of projects that Urban Renewal undertakes to make sure that they are projects that increase the assessed value within an urban renewal area. And although we have had plans and, and particularly in this plan, you do still have a Tonkin Trail project of about $2.3 million. Um, they strongly prefer that in your urban renewal funding that you use the majority of your funds for those transportation or utility infrastructure projects that will help promote new assessed value to occur so that um, they, they forego a lot of money so that they, at the end of the urban renewal time period, they actually do see growth from that, uh, those projects that are undertaken and they do get more money than they would have if urban renewal didn't exist. So given the fact that you do have other funding resources for that um, one particular park, we, uh, we, we through our discussion, remove that from the list um, for urban renewal to fund. And Ross can't, couldn't be uh, present with us uh, for this discussion, but we will be back on uh, the end of July to talk about the Basalt Creek Park planning process. And he, he is very aware of and is actively um, thinking about how to pursue funding for the park. So just because it's not in the urban renewal plan doesn't mean it's off the table. To answer your question, Commissioner Pratt? <laughs> yeah, I don't necessarily like it, but yes, thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Elaine or Jonathan? So I'm just going to follow up on that. So, you know, we're not saying that parks will not be built in the Basalt Creek area. It's just a matter of the dollars from the urban renewal zone will not be used to pay for it. It'll be used, you know, pay for, you know, grants, SCCs. Also, if we normally, you know, do, it's just specifically urban renewal dollars won't be used to be paid, will not be used to pay for these parks. But we do anticipate, the park, you know, in our parks discussion in the July that we know, that uh, the developers have set aside some acreage over where the residential area will be for a park. Then, as you mentioned, Commissioner Pratt, uh, we made a commitment to the uh, business community that if we're collecting STC fees from commercial development, that we would put some sort of trails or pocket parks or their shelters or something in that area. But urban renewal dollars won't be used to do that. STCs, grants, all the other you know, funding mechanisms will be used to pay for it. Other questions, comments? People are starting to look like zombies here. <laughs> All right, so I'm not seeing any more questions or comments. So how do people feel about the resolution? Am I going to hear a motion to uh, consider resolution number 628-21? I'll make a motion to um, approve resolution number 628-21. I need a second. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 628-21. Any discussions on the motions? All right. Uh, Commissioner Hilliard. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. 
Aye. Chair Braggs. I still want to park also, but I. <laughs> Commissioner Brooks. I, uh, I'm very reluctant. I, I, I feel there's some, I have a lot of questions about this. Uh, Commissioner Reyes. Yes. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Sacco. Aye. And I vote aye also, so the resolution is approved and adopted. Uh, that's it on the commission agenda for tonight. Um, again, as Commissioner Pratt was just mentioning, I'm watching the temperatures drop quick for my little phone here. We might be down to 71 by 11 o'clock. Holy cajoli. <laughs> Can open the windows, put the fans in. All right. <laughs> so everyone ha have a good evening. Uh, I do I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor is to adjourn our commission meeting for the evening. Just throw up your hands. All right. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. And uh, you know, who thought we'd all think 90 was uh, a lot cooler than you know. That we can take 90 anytime now. It's easy peasy. But again, keep eyes on folks in your neighborhood. Make sure everyone's getting their water and cool and uh, make sure we're uh, our elderly and young are cared for during this heat wave. Have a good evening. Oh, Megan.